Masechet Ketuvot, Daf Mem Dalid. We are going to be, uh, begin a new Mishnah all about Mosi Shem Ra today. But before that, we are going to further discuss two statements of Rav Huna. We already mentioned these and we reconcile them together, but we're going to go back and analyze each of them. Uh, the first one that we're going to analyze second is the question of when does the obligation to pay the Ketuva begin from the time of Kiddushin or from the time of the signing of the Ketubah, which was done right before Nisuin. Rav Aseh here said from the time of Nisuin. Rav Huna, however, said it's from the time of Kiddushin. Um, at least for the base amount is uh, assumed already from the time of Kiddushin and is already applicable. Okay, we're going to go back to Rav Huna in a minute, but right now we're going to further analyze Rav Huna's statement that says, if a woman has two Ketubahs, why did she have two ketuvahs? Could be she had one and she thought she lost it. So then immediately they have to write another one. But then she found it. So now she has two. Um, so And now uh, she can only use one of them. So Ravuna says she can pick one. Whichever one is more beneficial for her. Um, she could pick the one that's more, but probably the one that's more is the later one. Where the husband said, you know what, you know, I really love you. I'm going to add more money to it. But then the lien is only from the later date. Or she could pick the lesser amount, but the lien is from an earlier date. So there's more uh, sure, she can be more sure that she'll be able to collect it from any land that he might have sold in between. Okay, so we go back to that. So Rav Huna said she can collect from this one or collect from that one. Those not act- was not actually these words were not Rav Huna's exact words as we just saw, but they're a paraphrase of what he said. So Lema Peliga de Rav Nachman. It seems that Rav Huna would disagree with the following statement of Rav Nachman. Which is okay. They're both Amoraim. They can they can disagree, but we want to know if they do or not. The Amar of Nachman Shene Shetarot Yosin Vezeach Harze Bitel Sheni Tarishon. Rav Nachman says if you have two documents, two contracts that come one after the other, uh, they're both uh, uh, about the same thing. For example. Uh, two documents that say, um, I sold my field to you. One is dated from January and one's dated from March. Um, and so what, what do we do? Well, since they're different dates, we assume that the second one nullifies the first. Uh, so that when we signed the second one, we found that there's something wrong with the first or for whatever reason, it's the second, the later document that will be the uh, controlling one. It'll make a difference for uh, produce that it produces in between, uh, liens on the land that happen in between, uh, taxes, other things like that. Who will pay them? Okay. Love me itamad Allah, amad of papa, umoder of Nachman, de e osif badikla, let osifet ketabe, hachaname, ha osif la midi. So at first we assume that Ravuna said you can pick either one that you want. She, the woman can pick either ketubah that she wants, but this seems to be go against. Rav Nachman, who says that it's the later one that takes effect and negates the earlier one, so they seem to disagree. But then we change that and say, no, in fact, Rav Papa says that Rav Nachman would agree that the second one is, uh, is that the, both of them are effective if the husband adds something to the ketubah. If he writes the exact same thing, then it would be the second thing. But if he adds even a palm tree, uh, and says, I'm giving give you all that amount that I said in the first one, plus I'm adding a palm tree. Um, then that would be, uh, the addition shows that he's, his intention is not to cancel the first, but he wants to add something to it. And in that case, the woman can choose either one. She can use the later one because it has an extra palm tree, or she can pick the earlier one because it has an earlier lien. And so even Rav Nachman would agree with that, if he's adding something to it. And here too, and so here he is adding something to the amount of the ketubah um, in, the Rav, uh, in Rav Huna's example. He says 200, the early one was 200, the later one was 300. So in fact, Rav Nachman does say that the second one cancels, cancels the first one out in other cases, uh, but regarding a ketubah, if the second one is more than the first, then she can't, Abnachman would agree with Rafuna, she can choose either one. 
All right. Now that we mentioned Rav Wuna, let's analyze his statement. Gufa Amar Rav Nachman Sheteh Shetarot Hayot Sein Bezeh Charze Bitel Sheni Tarishon. Two documents produce one after the other. The second one cancels out the first. So if it's a loan document, um, and uh, then the second one would mean that the, the later one would have a lien only on um, a land from the later date, not on land that you own from the earlier date. So it makes a big difference in what the creditor can collect from. Amada Papa, Moder Rav Nachman di Yosef Badikla lo Tosefet Ketabeh. Now Papa, as we just uh, quoted, says that Rav Nachman would agree in the case of a Ketuba. If he adds some detail, then that's not nullifying the first one, but adding to it, and therefore she could pick either one. Now, let's explain how this might apply to the cases of a sale. Or gift. Pishita rishon bemecher vesheni bematana. Leapot kochohu de katable, mishum dina de bar misra. If someone has two contracts about a land, first one is I sold you the land, and the second one, dated later, it says I gifted you the land. So now which one is it? There are different laws that may affect them if it's a sale or if it's a present. So in that case, we assume that both of them are actually effective. In fact, it probably it was a sale. So why would he write uh, that it's a gift now? That only to help out the and give extra rights to the buyer because of the law of neighbors. The law of neighbors says that um, if I give you, uh, if I sell you, the law of neighbors only applies for sale, not for a gift. If I sell you land and then my neighbor says, hey, I wanted that land. If the if the person that is uh, yeah the, that's adjacent to the land that I sold says I wanted the land he the neighbor has a right to it because if you have two fields right next to each other it's much easier to plow all of them at once and um, so for the neighbor we um, uh, want to you know increase the overall economy and so the neighbor has first rights to buy the land better to have one bigger field adjacent than two half fields that are not near each other and so it's um that's a, a big benefit for the neighbor and the person i'm selling it to he could just he could buy a field somewhere else for the same price uh, so no difference to him so the law is if i do sell it to you and my neighbor comes and says he wants it the neighbor has a right to repossess that land and pay and and would would uh, pay you that amount that you paid for it um so if we want if i want to protect you from my neighbor so that you will keep it so i might first may have a, a bill of sale that's the official one and then have like a second set of books uh it's a gift now the law of neighbors does not apply to a gift because i gave you a gift you can't come and say uh the neighbor can't come and say get a gift somewhere else right you don't have the opportunity to get a gift from anywhere and so therefore if i give it to you as a gift the neighbor cannot repossess it so there uh, in this case since there's a good reason why i would write the second document i, I didn't mean to nullify the, the sale but rather i meant to just make the sale better by making it look like a gift to trick the neighbor so in that case, that is similar to adding something to the Ketubah. It shows I want to add something. I do not want to nullify it. And all the more so if the first one was a gift. So actually, I gifted it to you. And then afterwards, I wrote a bill of sale and it says that I sold it to you. Uh, why would I do that? Well, in that case, it would be to, because of the law of a creditor. So if I owed someone money then the, and I don't have uh, cash to pay it, then I don't have land to pay it, then that creditor can come and say, I had a lien on the land that you gave away. And he will come and take that land. Um, and now you, I gave you a gift. You're going to just, uh, it was a bad gift. I gave you a gift and someone took it away. And, you know, you invested in it. You look forward to it. So if I want to make my gift stronger, what I will do is first I'll give it to you as a gift. Then we'll write a fake uh, a document that said, I sold it to you. And the point of that document is if the land should be repossessed by my creditor, then I would have an obligation to uh, repay you the amount that you, for the, the, that same amount, so that you won't ever lose your gift. If someone does take it as a, because they had a lien, then I will be obligated to reimburse you for that amount. So there too, there would, could be a reason why I would write a second document uh, in order to somehow improve the first one. And I didn't mean to nullify the first one.
Okay, so all that Rav Nachman would agree to. Uh, so in what case did Rav Nachman say that the second one undoes the first, cancels the first? And if they're both the same, two of them were uh, sale, both of them were documents of sale, or both of them were documents of a gift, then the second one undoes the first one. Maita'ama. And what is the reason for the second one uh, undoing the first one? Uh, it could be that I am admitting, I, I wrote the document, but I'm admitting that the first document, there was something wrong with it, right? Maybe uh, 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 for whatever reason, uh, it was a forged document, it was, wasn't real, and so I say, listen, I, I'm sorry about that, now I want to make it a real document, or something wrong with it. Okay, so that could be one reason. Ravacha amar emar achule achle le shibude. Or, it could be if it's a bill of sale, uh, then here's a general rule about a bit of a bill of sale. If I uh, sell you a field, uh, then um, a, a, any lien that's on it, there's always potential someone might have a lien and come and repossess it. If someone does repossess it, I have an obligation to repay you. And in fact, you can come after any other land I have. So the bill of sale also creates a lien on my other land. Uh, so you have the land that I just sold you, but just in case that one's taken away, I'm going to owe you other land. So the earlier the document, the better it is for you because you will have a lien on uh, land that I currently have. Now, if that, let's say we, we signed in January. Now, the second one is in March. Um, in the meantime, I had some land in February that I sold. Um, it, once, if, if we only use the second document, the one in March, then, and uh, I sell you the field, in, it says I sold you the field in March, and that land ends up being repossessed, you will not be able to go after the land that I had already sold in February. Um, so, therefore, it's better for you for the buyer to have the earlier one rather than the later one. So Rav Acha says, um, why would the second cancel out the first? Well, if you agreed to sign the second one, it must be because you forgave the lien uh, during January and February. All right, so you, you agreed that you're, you won't be able to go after that, and now you're re-signing in March. And so since you must have agreed to that, because otherwise why would you sign that document, uh, therefore the second one cancels out the first and you can no longer collect from that the lien, uh, the lien um, uh, lands that I owned in between. Okay, so those are two possibilities. Um, it could be either of them. Um, now, my benayhu, what would be a practical difference between the two reasons? Ika benayhu oru ae sahade. It will have an effect on the reliability and the uh, um, uh, 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 status of those witnesses, the ones that signed the first document. Because if they signed, the, the, if their signatures are on the first document, and it turns out that it was a forgery, it was a false document, then any other documents that I might have, or that you might have, with the same uh, si uh, with the same signatures, we have to suspect that maybe those are also forged. Um, so uh, that will have an effect. Whereas according to Ravacha, there was nothing wrong. The first document was valid, but now we agreed to re uh, 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 renegotiate the terms. And so that's why the first one, there's nothing wrong with the witnesses. Okay, also another difference is Ushalome Pere U Tachska. Who deserves the produce that it produces in between the January and March? And who is responsible for paying the taxes to the government during that time? If we say that uh, the first one was actually an invalid document, that means the sale never went through in January. So it means I, the original owner, owned it that whole time. So therefore, I deserve the fruit and I have to pay the taxes during that time. Whereas, according to Rav Acha, that says, in fact, it was a real sale during January, valid sales, a valid document. Uh, and we just decided to renegotiate the terms of when the lien starts. Well, then you actually owned it the whole time, so you deserve, the buyer deserve the fruits, and also you would have to pay the taxes. All right, so that all was the discussion of the second statement of Rav Huna. Now we're going to go all the way back to the first statement of Rav Huna, where he said that the obligation to pay the Ketubah starts at the time of Kiddushin. Even if you didn't actually write it, it's just assumed at that point. Um, whereas Rav Aseh said, no, it has starts at the time of the writing of the Ketubah, 
uh, which is right before the marriage ceremony, and there could be several months in between. So, may have a de kituba. So, what's what do we say about that? What are we going to decide about that machloket? Tashema de Amara Yehuda, Amara Shemuel, Mishum de El Azar, but be Shimon. This is a really nice chain, right? Rav Yehuda, the second generation Amora, quotes Shemuel, the first generation Babylonian Amora, who quotes to be El Azar, a fifth generation Tana, who is the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, uh, or a fourth generation Tana, a student of Rabbi Akiva, right? Rabbi El Azar is the one that was in the cave with his father. Okay, so we have a nice chain going all the way back from uh, Moraim to, back to Tanaim. Who said, Mane Mataim min ha erusin sefet min ha nisuin? That if uh, uh, the, someone has a ketubah and now they, uh, they want to come collect it and maybe there's not enough funds, so they have to go and repossess it from land that he might, that uh, he once owned, she, she's, she's demanding the ketubah. Um, I'll say upon divorce, right? Uh, and she says, you have to pay me. He doesn't have cash available, so she wants to go after land. So which land can she go back, go to? How far back can she go if the, some land was sold in between? So he says, for the 100 and 200, for the base amount, that goes from the time of Kiddushin. For the additional amount above what the absolute necessary, that starts from the time of Nisuin. That was the that was the opinion of Rav Huna above that the base amount starts at Kiddushin. Good. Chachamim uh, omrim echad ze vechad ze min a Nisuin. However, the sages who disagree with the Rabbi Shimon say that both the base amount and the extra added amount of the Ketubah and the lien only be, and responsibility to pay only restart from the time of Nisuin. <coughs> That was the opinion of Rav Aseh above. Okay, good. So we see that this Machloket between uh, later Amoraim is actually reflected already in, uh, in among Tanaim. The final halacha is like Chachamim, um, which is the same as Rav Aseh, that the lien is from a later date. The next Mishnah is going to be all about the law of Mosi Shemra. What is it doing here in Masechet Kitubot? Well, it relates to the last two uh, uh, topics, where, which were about the rape and seduction. Uh, those were uh, areas where the fine is, goes to the father. So this one also is going to involve a fine. And uh, let's review the Pesukim first. A man takes a wife, but ends up he doesn't like her. And so that means he wants to divorce her, right? I guess right after the marriage, but he also doesn't want to pay the amount of the ketubah. So the way he wants to get out of it is by the sam la alilot de barim aleha shem ra. He trumps up charges against her, and he says, I took uh, took this wife. Right? We got engaged, we got married, and we they consummated the marriage. And I found there was no bitulim, and you know I assumed that she had bitulim, and I, I agreed to. To pay her two hundred, so that's it. I don't want to pay her two hundred anymore. So now he's commit. He's accusing her of actually committing adultery before between kiddushin and nisuin. So, if it turns out that he's false, he's lying, uh, then the father of this na'ara, so you see it has to be a na'ara, uh, we're going to discuss if it, if it works for other ages, if this law applies to other ages, and the, and the mother, and they're going to bring the, the evidence of the betuli, maybe the bedsheet, uh, to the uh, gate where the elders are. Says, I gave over my daughter to this man, and he decided he hates her. He's claiming that she did not a betulim, but look right here. Here's proof that she did. And spreads out the cloth in front of them. If he does that, then the elders will come, will take him, and they uh, give him lashes. And furthermore, he has to pay 100 kesef and is paid to the father 
of the Na'ara. So you see that this is a common theme with the other two laws that we already studied. And furthermore, he has to take care of her the rest of his life, this Mosi uh, Shemra. Whether she wants to continue to be married to him or not, that's up to her. But he um, has to is responsible for her food, clothing, shelter forever, and is not he is not allowed to divorce her. Okay, now that's all one case. If he is lying, that's the Moshe Shemra part. But if he is correct, and it turns out she really did not a bitulim, and she did uh, cheat on him after the kiddushin, and Vameta. So then they uh, um, will take this naada again, it's called naada, outside the door, the the gate of her father's home. Uh, interesting place to do that, uh, just to publicly shame not only her but the father that uh, could um, brought up a child that would do this. And they stone her. Uh, the the people of the city stone her uh, and vameta, and she will die. We're going to learn something from that, from this word. She did something that was a t- a sh- shameful in Israel. We're going to learn something from this word also, that she has to be born Jewish and not a convert. Because uh, she uh, committed the sin and are under her father's house, meaning while she was not yet married, she was still living in her father's house and she went with another man. So this is a special law of Sikila. The general um, uh, punishment for adultery in usual cases is chenik, strangulation. So this is a special one that applies um, uh, in when, when you have these particulars. And get rid of the evil from your midst. Okay, so those are the, those are the Pesukim. And now the Gemara is going to start off with the difference between the uh, um, if she's born Jewish or not. And says, Hagiyodet, Shinkaira Bita Ima Vizineta, Harezo Behayanek. If you have a, a young girl, this whole law only applies to Naada, so it has to be someone young. So if you have someone who converted, she and her daughter, and the daughter got engaged and uh, was unfaithful, Harezo Behayanek, she gets the usual strangulation, not the stoning, because that was only be someone who's born Jewish. Um, now, in this case, it doesn't actually matter that the mother also converted. Uh, it's just giving a usual case because if such a young girl converted, then why she could have converted on her own? Um, maybe she converted with her family, with her mother. And la lo petach beta av lo velo mea sela. Um, but uh, now, because she is a convert, so the whole entire law of Mosi Shemra does not apply, and uh, so this does not happen at the gate of her father. Um, it, well, she's a convert, so because she's a convert, her biological father is not her legal father anyway. Um, and also, there is no payment of a hundred sela because the payment goes to the father, and once again. There is no legal father here. Um, okay, so that's the law of the Giyoret. Um, uh, okay. What if when at the time that the mother became pregnant, the mother was not Jewish, and uh, but she got, she, she, um, converted while she was pregnant. So once if she can, if the mother converts while she's pregnant, then the fetus also is automatically converted. The fetus is still considered a convert for the laws of conversion. The fetus, the baby does not have to do another conversion after it's born, but so it's born Bikidusha. So what's the law in that case? Hadezo Biskila, since she was born Jewish, even though she was not conceived Jewish, that's sufficient for her to be under the law of the death penalty, special death penalty of Sikila for this case. But she still doesn't have a father, a legal father, so if she's guilty, the Sikila does not happen at the entrance to her father's house. It'll happen somewhere else. And the the guy who did the Mosi Shemra, if he is lying, does not have to pay the hundred selah, uh, because there's no father. If it's a regular case, 
um, even if the mother was a convert. And, but she converted a while ago. And after she converted, she became pregnant and uh, gave birth. So that this, the daughter, who's the one that was unfaithful or accused of being unfaithful, um, so she gets the same law. So if the mother converted, but the ba- but the kid was uh, was uh, conceived and born Jewish, so then her father is her her biological father is her legal father, and so all of the laws apply. Good. Yesh la av and la petach bet av. Now a regular Jewish woman. A uh, girl who has a father, but the father, but there's no entrance to the father's house. Maybe they don't own a house. Maybe they live in, uh, uh, I don't know, an apartment building or something, or uh, there are nomads. Okay, they, if they're for whatever reason, there's no door of the house, um, or yesh la petach bet av and la av, or if they do have a family home, but there's no father, the father died. She nevertheless gets, nevertheless gets sekila. Although the sekila will not happen at the door, at the entrance of the father's house, if there's either no house or no father, nevertheless they'll get the, she'll get the um, sekila somewhere else because the that requirement uh, that it be in front of the father's house is not an absolute requirement, and if you don't have that, you don't do it at all, but rather it's a mitzvah. It's a, a, the best way to do it, to bring home the point that uh, we know this. if this happens, there'll be, be a punishment not only to the daughter, but shame upon the whole family. Uh, so that's the best way to do it, but that's not the uh, essential. It can be done without it. All right, that's the Mishnah. Now the Gemara is going to ask about the middle case there. How do you know uh, that if she was conceived when the mother wasn't Jewish, but born when the mother was Jewish, how do you know that in that case you still apply Sikila, even though she was not conceived Jewish? So, uh, so it says it's an extra word, really, because um, isn't it uh, kind of obvious that once she gets Sikila here, she's going to die. So this extra word is coming to include a case that we wouldn't otherwise know. So we know for sure if she's fully Jewish, then she's going to get sekila. The word vameta comes to include a case where she was, yeah, she was born Jewish, but she, her conception was when she was not Jewish. Good. Hold on. If you're going to include the case of when she was conceived not Jewish in, under this law of Mosi Shemra, then you should apply all the other details of it and all also, you should give him lashes if he is lying and make him pay. Uh, so why don't you apply everything uh, to, uh, to her uh, in this case? No, the extra word here is focused. It says focused on the death penalty. Although only We only in, include someone else that we wouldn't otherwise know for the death penalty. So that's, that's, that's the case of someone who was uh, conceived not Jewish. Um, but for the fine, no, or for lashes, didn't say anything about that. Okay. Wait. Why do you have to uh, go so far to assume that we're including that case? Why don't you say that we're including a, a, a smaller case, the, the, the case of where the mother had converted, but the child was uh, had converted before conception. So the child was conceived and born uh, Jewish. Why not say we're including just that case and not go all the way to the case where she would conceive when she was not Jewish and say that it's this case that the the, the, the sikila applies to and not the not the previous one. No, hahi Israel Israelit Malia Tahi. No, that girl, she's totally Jewish, right? She was so it has makes no difference if the mother was uh had converted. This girl is fully, fully Jewish, she conception and uh um and uh, birth. So therefore, we don't need any extra word to include such a case. Okay. Oh wait, now the opposite. Since you have an extra word, maybe the extra word is more powerful and it's coming to include any case. And even if this g- girl was uh, conceived and born, was even born not Jewish, and the girl is the one that converted, maybe the law of Moshe can apply the death penalty for Messi Shemra 
will apply even to someone who was born, not Jewish, was not born Jewish and converted. Um, since it says the word mita to include someone, no im can be Israel mayahanile. No, on the other hand, the pasuk also says be Israel, right? Uh, such a thing should not be done. Astana debela be Israel. So that is a counterbalance to say we're going to include someone, but not everyone. So if they're totally not Jewish and converted, no good. But the in between case when they conceived not Jewish and born Jewish, that is included. And the law of Sikila. Amar Rabbi Yosef Bar Chanina Mosi Shemra Al Yetoma Patur Shnemar Venatenu La Avia Naara Perat Lazo Sheen La Av. So Rabbi Yosef says, if a man uh, falsely accuses a girl, a Naara, his wife, who has no father, she the father died, he does not have to pay the fine because it says he gives to the father of the Naara. If she has no father, then he doesn't have to pay at all. That's Rabbi Yosef. Mativ Rabbi Yosef Bar Avin, a different Rabbi Yosef Bar Avin, challenges this from the following Braita, Ve'item Rabbi Yosef Bar Zevida. Okay, a lot of Rabbi Yosef says here. Ve'im ma'en yema'en aviha, le'ravot yetoma liknas tibri Rabbi Yosef ha-galili. Um, yet another Rabbi Yosef ha-galili says that you have an extra word, ma'en yema'en. Uh, this is back in, not, this is not the context of Moshe Shemra, but rather the context of the seducer, that if the father does not want to give his daughter over for marriage to the seducer, uh, then he has to, the seducer has to pay the father of the bride. And the ma'en ma'en comes to include that the yetoma, if she has no father, then you still has to pay the fine. Um, that was Pinebrio Segelili. Now, even though it's a different case, it's the, it's the seducer, um, and not Mosi Shemra, but the questioner um, here is assuming that it probably would be the same if he has to pay, if the seducer has to pay, uh, even though even though there's no father, then uh, certainly uh, the Mosi Shemra would have to pay. Is even more reason to because seducer she agreed to it. So as the we we discussed that above, since she agreed to it, so is she foregoing the fine? Okay, this opinion says not so. So according to this, for sure we should apply that to Mosi Shemra, and she should get the fine. Now, who motivated la? Who mefarek the la? The same Rabbi Yosef, but Avin, who asked the question, also answered it by saying, "Veba aleha veachar kach nit nit yatema." We're talking about a case where the father was alive at the time of the consummation of the marriage. So, and that's at that point that he's like, "Oh, this, you know, I don't like this uh, this girl, and I'm going to." Um, uh, and I'm going to, and he go, it goes and accuses her. So the consummation happened when there was a father, and therefore, and then the father died later. So since the uh, crime happened when the father was alive, so therefore he owes it to the father. When the father dies afterwards, um, during the time of sentencing, then she, the daughter, does get to get it. Okay, so that's how you can reconcile those two statements. Okay, Rava Ahmad Hayav. Rava, however, disagrees with um, Rabbi Yosef Bar, Bar Hanina, and he says she, if she has no father, the man still has to pay. And as the Mosi Shemra, and she's an orphan, he has to pay the hundred, the hundred shekel, and it goes to her. Mimai Meditane Ame. Betulat uh, Israel, velo betulat gerim. Since it says the word betulat Israel, um, uh, and so this comes to exclude a uh, betula of gerim. Now, what's the, what's the point? What does it have to do with having a father or not? The ger never has a father, right? The biological father is not the uh, legal father. So why would we? Why would you need to tell me that betulat Israel, not betulat gerim? Iyamat bishlama ki hay gavna Israel michaya. If you think that in the case of a Jew, regular Jewish kid that who has a father, um, or like this, has no father, if a regular Jewish kid is an orphan and has no father, has to pay, then it makes sense that you need to tell me, says, yes, if she's a Jewish kid and she once had a father and now the father died, um, and has to pay. That's why the pasuk comes to come and tell me, yeah, that applies to a Jewish kid who was an orphan, but it does not apply to to a girl who converted. 
because once she converted, she never had a father. Their father is not a father anymore. So that's why you would need to tell me that. So it all makes sense. It all makes sense. But if you say like above, it'll be say above, that if a Jewish girl is an orphan, then the man does not have to pay. If even for a Jewish orphan, the man does not have to pay, all the more so for a convert, who, once she converted, doesn't have a father, all the more so. So you wouldn't even need to, to have this derasha betulat Yisrael to exclude Gerim. Gerim would have been already excluded from the fine, since even a Jewish kid, uh, a Jewish orphan, does not get the, have the payment. Okay, so that's uh, Ravaz, proof. Good. Now, Amar Eshlakish, Hamosi Shemra ala ketana patur. Eshlakish says this law of Mosi Shemra applies only to a ne'ara between 12 and 12 and a half. If it's under 12, he does not have to pay the fine. Shene Amar venatenu le'aviha na'ara, na'ara male dibera katuv. The word na'ara is spelled with a he. We saw the statement of Eshlakish earlier, but this is the, the, the context, the original context. And so the na'ara with a he means that as nada specifically. Okay, that's Eshakish's statement and derivation. Matkif la Rav Acha Bar Abba. Rav Acha Bar Abba is going to uh, uh, reject the derivation, even though he agrees with the law. Tama dikhti ba na'ara ha lavachi hava mina filu ketana. You're telling me that the reason why this applies only to a na'ara and not to a ketana is because of that extra he? And if it wasn't, uh, and if it wasn't uh, written with the extra head, then it, then the whole law would apply even to a ketana. That can't be. Haketiv imemet. Haya davar azev lo nimseu lo nimsu betulim naara vehosiu et naara petach beta biha uskaluha. It says that if the accusation turns out to be true, and this wife, uh, uh, when uh, after kiddushin was unfaithful, then she gets the death penalty. Uktana, la baronashinhi, but a ketana, under 12 years old, never gets any punishment. They are not responsible and not liable for any punishment. So therefore, I would know on my own that the whole law of Shemra does not apply to a ketana. I don't need the extra he at the end. So I agree with the law of Shakish, but I don't think, I don't, we don't need the derivation. Rather, the narration is still useful. Ella kan naara hakom hakom sheneman naara afilu ketana b'mashma. But rather, what I can learn is that here, since I already know it does not apply to a ketana, but rather to a naara, so I can tell from here that the word naara with a he means a naara, not a ketana. Therefore, I can infer that any place that it says naara without a he, and it's a kriyotiv, it's um, we read it naara. But this actually shows that in ancient times, you wouldn't actually need all the imota kiri'a, right? You could spell na'ara without a he. You just uh, assume it's a kames. How would you know it's na'ad na'a na'ara? Well, you'd have to know from uh, from the oral tradition how to pronounce the, the word. Also from context, it has to be a girl, it can't be a boy. Okay, um, so, um, so I can derive, uh, I can actually use this uh, context of Mosi Shemra, since I already know it doesn't apply to a ketana, that other cases that doesn't say he, he, that it means only a ketana, it means only a na'ara and not a ketana. Baruch Adonai Lolam, Amen Vamen.